Well, everybody, uh, it's great to see you all here on campus again today. Uh, my name is Jerry Greenberg. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And Karen Weiss Jones uh, asked me to moderate this intense liberal arts experience. Um, I looked up what moderate means. <laughs> and it means to make things less intense. So uh, given, given the panel that we have in front of you, I, I think that's probably a good idea because I think without moderation, it could become quite intense and probably will anyway. Let me just introduce uh, the members of the panel and, and then we'll get started. So uh, I'm just going to mention their names and the department that they're from. So Lisa Manning is from the physics department on the end there. Next to her is Duncan Brown, also from the physics department. Next to Duncan is Natalie Russo from the psychology department, William Robert from the religion department, Mary Lovely from the international relations department, PAIA. What department are you coming from these days? Economics and international relations. Okay, very good. Where's Judy? Is Judy here? <laughs> She's an IR and econ, so I know. Oh, we there she is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then we have Mary Carr from our creative writing program in the English department. Next to her is George Saunders from our creative writing program in the English department. And then here next to me, last but not least, is Jason Wiles from our biology department. So these are really intense representatives of the College of Arts <laughs> and Sciences. They, they truly are. And our, uh, you know, the span of the fields that, that we have represented here is a great representation of what it means to be at a liberal arts and, uh, and sciences college, or College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we could really spend a lot of time talking about what the liberal arts are, what arts and sciences is. Uh, you all had some readings. There are lots of different ways to think about things and try to define what the liberal arts are. But I thought I would start off with a question on the assumption that you all have some inherent idea of what the liberal arts are and ask why we think the liberal arts are still important today. Liberal arts have been around for a long time and we are continually talking about why they're important. We have uh, a wide representation. Would anybody like to uh, start off with a response to why the liberal arts are important from their perspective? <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> Great. Because then maybe I don't have to talk again. <laughs> um, so, so for me, uh, when I was thinking about sitting on this panel, I think it's the mixture of quantitative analysis and also communication and an ability to uh, understand, sort of parse, and then make one's own argument that makes a liberal core really impressive for doing many, many different things today. And so, so there's many things which we care about um, that we need to make important decisions about in our society, and having the combination of analysis skills that you get from some quantitative classes and then also the ability to communicate your ideas and also understand the ideas of people who might think differently than you and really appreciate them is something that could help uh, individuals make a difference in whether it be in a company or sort of in government, things like this. It's really important to have those skills. I'm not sure about the question itself, right? Uh, why is it more important today or why is it Still important still today, important. that's the thing. <laughs> I think it's more important today, right? Because we have information from everywhere on everything, and we don't know if it's good information, if everybody has a voice that everyone can get to. You need the liberal arts to kind of teach you about how to critically analyze, how to think about the sources of information that are there, and that's really what it does. Uh, you may not know everything in a field or many fields, but when you have to get information, you can find it from all kinds of sources, from people who may or may not know things, may have all kinds of agendas, and if you can analyze that uh, critically, then you have a better chance of getting good information. Well, one of the things that I love, uh, in creative writing, we get to work closely with a group of, uh, in six in fiction and six in poetry, that's coming from an applicant pool of about 800, mm -hmm. so they're incredible. But one of the things that we, I think that we're doing beautifully is we're uh, taking a young person who's coming in, and I always think of it as widening their stance a little bit. Mm -hmm. So they come in with talent. We teach them that through, in our case, close attention to text, their stance widens so they can take on any text and understand it. Uh, they, they have a way of um, interrogating uh, the world, really, 
and an increased confidence that they can do that, which then makes a bigger citizen. That, you know, so, so what I love is when someone comes in a little shaky-legged, a little nervous, a little insecure, and just through very subtle, close working with them over three years, you see them get bigger, you know, bigger-hearted, uh, more confident, and more willing to exist in that area of ambiguity that the modern life requires of us. So that kind of confidence building, to me, is really a <coughs> wonderful part of it. And, and you, we do that beautifully here one-on-one. -on -one. You know, in, at close quarters, the younger scholar watches the older scholar and picks up so many subliminal and subtle things along the way. I, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the student we, I met with this afternoon who came here from his third tour of, uh, of Iraq, uh, a kid from Mississippi, very rough around the edges, given our applicant pool. Um, from an economically more deprived background than, than many of our students, uh, albeit, you know, not a person of color or something, but but a kid who was was not really at home in a way in the level with the level of intellectual discourse that we that we deal with the the, the te kinds of texts we deal with, and what's happened to him in the past three years. I mean, this is a small and dumb thing, but. One of the things we do is we have a little meditation group, just a meditation group that just meets. And, and I think managing how you feel as a human being, particularly for someone just out of a war zone, uh, and, and, but we all have been interested in and following this kid who was, a, frankly, a little scary. <laughs> frankly, a little bit scary when he, when he first got here. And, and um, he said to me, I, I, "Don't worry, I, I don't kill the good people like you." You're <laughs> 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 being a little facetious, I think. But, 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 <laughs> even, but even even so, um, and to see his relationships bloom, uh, mostly, in fact, with the kids of color, as it's turned out, it's been, and seeing his political, his set of political opinions broaden and become more inclusive. And we also, we keep up with them all the time so that I have a student in his class, he's in George's class now, and I said, how are his stories now? Because I had helped edit a story of his last year. And uh, Lori said to me, you won't believe how much more like himself he sounds. Yeah. The stories were very emotionally guarded and emotionally protected and kind of hard, and he didn't even, he wouldn't use a third person, it would be we, you know, but it, it was like an emotional or psychological thing that was going on with him. Uh, and then he was in my office this afternoon talking about working with you on whatever story you just helped him with, but he, he seemed to think you had waved some wand over it. That's why I kept. Well, I, I have that wand. I just, uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's one student of 12, but there isn't a student we have who doesn't. And while he was here, he met a student of ours who was here 20 years ago as an undergraduate, <coughs> and then later <coughs> came to the MFA program, Phil LaMarche, who wound up getting seven figures for two, a two-book deal from somewhere. But anyway, they both hunt, and they're both having this kind of redneck hunting <laughs> conversation. <laughs> no, but it's, I'm just saying that it's, it's, a level of diversity and a breadth of experience. We don't mostly, the ones who go on are very serious. We, it continues to be a community outside the university. Yeah. Um, and, and so I know I've gone on too long, no, sort no, of tooting our own horn, but I, I think a lot of it is about the moral, emotional, psychological, spiritual development of all these people within a community that makes them bloom as artists. Well, from the divine to the, I'm an economist. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a small seminar this semester with our distinction students who are among our very best students. Two thirds of them also have a major or minor in mathematics or applied statistics. And some of the things that you said really uh, resonated with me. One was having students deal with ambiguity. Uh, you know, when you're in high school, you see things kind of black and white, and the world isn't that way. And, and, and giving them the confidence to do that. And you ask, how do you 
you know, to, to, to s realize that life is complex. There's a lot of different factors, and you're never going to be 100% confident as you move forward. How do we do that? And it's really giving them skills, supporting them. I like to say to my students, once they have a topic for their senior thesis, you, I don't want you to spend one minute worrying about your topic. I want you to spend it working. I'm going to worry for you. You're going to just do this. Because anxiety holds us all back from really you know, reaching for the stars. And you just watch them go. And, and you know they do this senior thesis, and it's OK sometimes. Sometimes it's published. Sometimes it's not. But it's not the end of their life. It's the beginning of their life. Mm -hmm. And we had a sort of a gestational you know, moment with them that's really very precious, and it's really a great privilege to be part of that. Um, but it, it, it is important to give them the confidence, as Mary said, but also to, to help them deal with ambiguity. And my other hat is chair of international relations. Of course, we really see the power of the liberal arts, where there is no problem in the world that can be solved with one discipline. And so we truly look to have students getting classes from across the disciplines when we think about Syria, when we think about how EU is responding to migration flows. There's just, I mean, I could just go on and on and on. Students are being trained to look at that from an economic perspective, a political perspective, a cultural perspective, a historical perspective, a religious perspective. And it's, it's having sort of the depth of faculty that we have within the College of Arts and Sciences that allows me to have the confidence to say, you know, I'm going to create, help to create this program, and I'm going to know that they're going to be safe in the hands of all these different people, and they're going to figure it out. So I, I, I think it's a great time to be teaching, and it's a, it, it, we're really, you know, feeling like things are, are, uh, are, are progressing nicely around here, I think. How about you in religion? Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that the question was going to be, what is the value of a liberal arts education? <laughs> Did you ask that? <laughs> well, why are they why still are they important? important? Right? Yeah, and sure. The reason, that's in, the reason that that semantic distinction makes a difference is because I was thinking about it, and I thought, well, the question is not what is the value of a liberal arts education, it's what is the value? of a liberal arts education. That is, what is the value underneath that? What is the value mm -hmm. that a liberal arts education is touting? Not the usefulness, not mm -hmm. the value uh, in terms of success, economic prosperity, et cetera. What is the value? What is the quality that's, that is at the heart of the liberal arts? And I think actually, and, and I really did think this before, uh, it's uncertainty. Because certainty, especially we know in religion, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thinking that you know the answer, thinking that you have the truth is dangerous. Understanding that you don't know everything, understanding that there are people out there from whom you can learn, and that learning is still part of your job, that's helpful, that's growth, that's humanity. And so I think that's the value of a liberal arts education. Yeah. Um, and and the, the other part, I had a four part answer, that was one part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you part two and then Natalie. Maybe can you can use three and four later. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry but, prepared more than one question. <laughs> the other reason that it's important is because I'm sitting here right now and I wouldn't be if I hadn't had a liberal arts education. Um, class that I learned the most in in college, the class that I draw on the most often, the class that taught me the most about how to teach writing and how to teach thinking, was basic painting. Hmm. Because it drew me out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It forced me to do something that I wasn't going to be very good at. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't particularly good at <laughs> basic painting. <laughs> but I fell in love with it. I got to think differently. And, it, and I had to put my work up on the wall and be criticized. And that taught me all kinds of things that I never would have learned if I would have just stayed in the safety of my little disciplinary bubble where I was good at things, mm -hmm. pulling me out of my comfort zone, teaching me what it is to not be the best at something. That was what was so important to me. And that's what eventually led to me sitting here right now. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> Are we allowed to move on? <laughs> Are we allowed to move on? I think for me, I think about the liberal arts as, like, I think, George, you mentioned this as opening you up, right? I think in science, you get sort of 
you learn about the thing that you're going to become an expert about, and you kind of sometimes lose sight of how that fits into the bigger picture. Um, and for me, having some of my best ideas have come when I've thought about the history of the problem, or the philosophy around the questions that we're asking, uh, or the kinds of ways that we think about things. And it's when I think outside of the box, or I use the liberal arts classes, or the knowledge that I've gained in how to think about things, that I think some of my best research ideas have come from. And certainly when I have students, I have a lot of students, I have 12 to 14 undergrad students in my lab that generally stick around for two to three years, so I get to see them grow. They all come in, you know, wanting to learn about autism and work with kids with autism. And when they leave, some of them go to med school, some of them go to grad school, some of them go to public policy. So I have someone doing a master's in epidemiology. And mm -hmm. all of that comes from the background, not just learning the one thing, but really learning across a variety of disciplines how to think and how to embed knowledge from one area into another and how to you know, put questions together to answer them from a different way. I think you might as well finish this off and then. Sure. So, <laughs> so um, from, from my perspective, I mean, people have touched on many things. And to me, there are, there are two aspects of why a liberal arts education is, is important. There's the, there's the practical aspect, and then there's the kind of bigger picture aspect. I think, Lisa, you kind of touched on the practical aspect. For me, as a scientist, you know, I had two courses in English. I had English language and English literature when I was a student. And it's like, okay, why am I taking English language and English <laughs> literature? Well, my English well, at some point, I know you're going to be a scientist, but you're going to have to write papers and explain that to people. <laughs> and if you can't explain that to people, you're not actually doing any meaningful science. So the, the training you're getting on you know, the, the, the liberal arts side is going <coughs> to help you in your science education. And now I teach astronomy to non-science majors. And so the quantitative teaching that I teach to non-scientists helps them in, you know, they're not going to become physics majors, they're not going to become astronomy majors, but the quantitative skills they get help them in the careers they're pursuing in law or international relations or any other field of um, uh, non-STEM fields. So there's kind of the practical aspect, but then there's also just the general, you know, human interest aspect. I mean, I, you know, in STEM we can often get sucked into like studying some particular sciences, we can some particular microchip or some surface science thing. I look for black holes, right? Why do I look for black holes? Because black holes are cool. There is no other good reason, right? The, you, the US taxpayers, fund me to look for black holes. And why do you do that? Because black holes are cool. And we want to know about them. Because why not? We live in a society, and this is one aspect from the STEM and the many other aspects in humanity, we are lucky enough to live in a society that is wealthy enough and privileged enough that we can take from our tax dollars and, and give to people and pursue these things just to make us better as people, as better as a species. And that is cuts across all the liberal arts, right? We pursue these to make ourselves better as a species, to learn more, to explore more. And yes, you know, the way I look for black holes is build massive computers that then we can use in industry and use to build microconductors and things like this. But you know, the goals, these big picture goals that we can pursue across STEM and across the humanities, across many different fields, they just, they're just worthy goals to pursue. And that cuts across everything. And that's, to me, kind of what a liberal arts education is about. Well, I must say, we're not done, but that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, re it really was, because uh, as you know, since I, I know that w one of my blog posts was, was sent out to you all, and if you read it, you know that my belief is that everything is part of the way, right? And we had everything from the sciences, to the humanities, to the creative writing, to the social sciences, it all fits into this bigger picture. Now, the, the other thing that I was really uh, felt rewarded to hear about was the idea of uncertainty and, and not always knowing what's right. Well, I had five questions written out, and I used my first one, and now I have a lot of uncertainty about what to do <laughs> next. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think I'm going to use any one of my next questions, because we do have a, a limited amount of time, and, and we really do want to hear from everybody, I think. But building off of that answers to that first question, and also building off um, the uh, group that I was with earlier today talking about um, what to do for the students at the university, you know, how to enhance the, the student experience. How would you, uh, what can we do to get students at Syracuse University to 
somehow better appreciate the impact that the liberal arts have? Or what can we do to make the liberal arts have a bigger impact at Syracuse University in general? I think that's something that we're all interested in, in trying to promote. We certainly have thought about it for, for quite a while. You all are looking at it from different perspectives. And I've been talking a lot to try to give you enough time to think about an answer. <laughs> so hopefully oh, by the time I'm <laughs> done, you'll be able to have an answer. So can George? I start with one, there's one thing. I, I'm not sure this is the, uh, a useful idea. But I, there's a, an art critic named Dave Hickey. And he wrote a really wonderful piece a few years ago. And he, basically what he says is. Air guitar. Yeah. It, but he said one, it, it, it's in that book. He says, we have to be careful if you are a believer in the liberal arts. You have to be careful not to get too addicted to the utility argument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if, for example, if you say art can't exist because it can do these things, that sets the stage for somebody to come in and say, oh, if it doesn't do those things, it has no value. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things we can do is to, is to kind of stop flinching or apologizing for the liberal arts mm -hmm. and, and actually say, well, look, we're on this planet a very short time. Uh, we mostly think we know what we're talking about. But in fact, you die at the end. Uh, there's a lot of things that are. We do. Yeah. But there are so many. Yes, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many things that are inexplicable. So the basic human stance should be humility. We don't. We don't actually know. The liberal arts are not kind of a, a poor cousin coming along saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, can we can we just sort of hold your bags, Mr. Practical? But it's actually the, assen the essential human activity. So I think when we start, those of us who believe that, start inhabiting it a little more confidently, I think the students will go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You're, you, you guys are interested in the biggest questions there are with no apologies. Then I think the whole kind of ethos will kind of adjust up a little bit. You know, we have nothing to apologize for. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I'm with you there, yeah. for sure. That, that I've seen that practically with, with many of the students who come into Syracuse, because I've, I've done undergrad advising, and a lot of students come in, particularly students I've been assigned to, who want, you know, they want to be pre-meds, because that's the, oh, yeah. it's a career. And there are students who like, you know, you can tell they want to be philosophy majors. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you want to do that, that's worthwhile. Do it, yeah. pursue that, it will help you. You might even become a doctor at the end of it. You'll just be a well-rounded doctor. <laughs> well, and the punchline of this hickey thing is, if you, if you, if the arts, if you talk about the arts in terms of what they should do, somebody's going to come along and, and tell you what they must do. Then you've lost all your, all your power. You've lost the magic. You've lost the magic. <laughs> <laughs> he had a piece in the New Yorker in which he lost his magic this week. So. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're confident. He'll get it back. He'll get it back. <laughs> Misplaced. Natalie, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's difficult perhaps at the at the big level, um, but I know that you know I think advising is one place where it's really uh, an opportunity to talk to students about the value, right. as you were referring to it, of the liberal arts. And I think a lot of students come in and they're like, I just got to check the boxes of that core. And our job as advisors is to say, no, <coughs> this is the opportunity for you to take those classes that you never thought you could take, mm -hmm. that scare you or that challenge you in a way that you never really wanted to be challenged. You never even realized. This is, you know, it's the same thing about university. University is not about, you know, putting your head, I mean, it's about putting your head down and doing your work, yes, but it's also about expanding your horizons. And the liberal arts are the place where you get to do that, right? To challenge yourself outside of your comfort zone. And so oftentimes I'm the director of the neuroscience program here and uh, for undergraduates. And you know, I push my students to take philosophy of the mind and to take those classes. And they all kind of push back. I'm like, you have no idea how much <laughs> this is gonna help you open your mind to a way that you to a different way of thinking that's going to do nothing but enrich your life, period. I still have a hard time convincing them, but I'm working well, on it. You have a hard time convincing yeah. them, right? Because you're, you're a little bit removed from a first year student, yeah. or at least they perceive you to be that way yeah, in a way that you might <laughs> not know, right? So, so that's one of the things when you ask, well, what can we do? Um, well, we can use the very recent experience of our upper division students who have had these really transformative experiences. And you're, you're talking about your student who really sounds more like himself now. Yeah. They, they've really kind of gotten used to this ambiguity, right? They've, they've kind of gotten over this discomfort with not knowing the right answer. Mm -hmm. And they've become 
inspired by searching for an answer that nobody knows. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to do is get my upper division science majors talking with my first year undeclared sci uh, students really to talk great. about, you know, why, you know, don't worry about being a pre-med and needing the right answer. Be a scientist, be some kind of explorer, be somebody who's making something or discovering something that nobody knows. They can't tell you you're wrong. They didn't know the right answer and you <laughs> found it, right? right so right. that's one of the things if we can get our students interacting with each other across the different levels so that they can see the kinds of uh, opportunities, the opportunities they have and what they can lead to a year from now, two years from now, not by the time they have a PhD. So, yeah. Anybody else have anything to contribute to that? Maybe this, uh, which is the liberal arts aren't about what happens in my classroom mm. and your classroom and your classroom. They're what happens between our classes. Mm -hmm. The liberal arts are about making those connections and seeing that, oh wait, something we talked about in our religion class is actually relevant <laughs> <laughs> to what's going on in my biology class. And that's actually relevant to what someone said to me last night at dinner. And that's actually relevant to this question that I've been dealing with in my own private life, that the liberal arts are about the betwixt and the between. They're about the connections between things at least as much as just the individual units. And I think when we are able to do that because we see that when we have the opportunities to do that in our classes, like in first year forum or something like that, uh, where I just make, I make my students read and they don't like it, but we read <laughs> real books and we have real discussions and we don't just talk about other stuff, but they, there it is, right there. And suddenly it matters. And when a student turns on and realizes that this matters, even though I thought it didn't. That's, <laughs> that's what's really cool. And I think that's what keeps us getting up in March, <laughs> <laughs> going to school after we shovel our driveway. <laughs> you know, some of our students are gone. We already have students who are in bachelor's, which surprised me. And uh, you know, senior aides to presidential candidates right now. And you like to think that that person knows more than economics, that they also understand something about life and beauty and family and other things, and they have to make these decisions. And uh, I think I was talking with you, Richard, about the fact that economists today are often trained just as they did economics undergrad. You know, they did math major. That's probably three quarters or you know of their program. And I think there's something lost in that. Um, we have to think about how do we create decision makers that really understand this idea about ambiguity, but also about beauty, about family, about what citizenship really means, about value. And um, that does happen between the, between the classes. When I went to college, um, I actually was an American Studies major, and truth be told, I was an American Literature major, because I did most of my classes in American Literature. And I was actually blessed by having uh, a mother and father who hadn't gone to college. Now, for most of my career, that was, a big dis that was a disadvantage, but it was a big advantage because they were just so in awe of the fact that I was in college <laughs> that they never said to me, like, what, what are you this? doing? <laughs> right? My mother just said, she's going to end up writing something, right? which, of course, <laughs> isn't what I did. But that was her way of kind of making sense of it. And I took a class on early American literature, actually, with a poet, Alan Grossman. Alan, <laughs> whom I knew well. Yes, I, I loved him. I knew him, him so well. I loved and him, too. And then I loved him so much. He, I went, took a whole class on Walt Whitman. Now, any normal parent would say, what? Are you taking a whole class on Walt Whitman? But he taught me to, you know, to really think about abstract structures and, and, and decompose those structures and interrogate the structures. And then later on, Lo and behold, I became an economist, and I'm sure my Econ 101 teacher is rolling over his, in his grave as we speak. But when I started to do uh, economics, I fell in love with general delivering theory, which is mathematical models of the economy. And I realized, you know, maybe 20 years later, that it was really that training and poetics that really helped me to do that. Now, I didn't do those classes because I was going to have a career in economics. I would have laughed you off the block if I thought that's what you were going to say. 
I did them because I loved it, because it was satisfying, because I was passionate about it. And because Grossman was a genius. He was a genius. And we just went in there, and you sat, and he started to lecture, and either you got it or you didn't. And if you didn't, you left the course. And if you wanted to stay there, you just worked your fanny off. And that's how it was. And it, it, and it really, I realize now, really set me on the career to be an economist. And I think I am a little bit different. I'm certainly the only one full professor in <laughs> economics, and I do different things. And I can connect to the students in a way by saying, I know economics is hard. I can <coughs> do it under <coughs> And I think they really do appreciate that. Um, but it really was the things that happened in between. I, and it's really impossible to, to tell a student, here's the path you should take, because it's going to be serendipity. It's going to be what they find, and they're going to bring something we don't know about, which is themselves to this, to this journey that they're going to go on. So we just try to encourage them, say uncertainty's OK. Here's the confidence to go forward. Um, and that's what we as advisors really try to do for our students. Anybody else have anything to contribute to this question? So the one thing that I sort of would say is, that is it in addition, is sort of touched upon by many people, is that in addition to uncertainty, the other thing that, to make an impact, to really sort of emphasize the, the impact that liberal arts can have, is to sort of get them away from an idea of immediate utility <laughs> for everything that they learn. Right? I have students come into my physics class, and they want to be able to be given the algorithm to solve problem X. Okay, and my job, as I see it, is to teach them that they should not be looking for the algorithm to solve problem X, but they should be learning how to think, sort of <laughs> metacognitively, about how to think about how to think, <laughs> right? And, 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 so, and, and so to do that, sort of, for example, in my class, like, one of the ways I tried to get them to think about this is the first five minutes of class, I sort of had a question which was just like, ask a physicist. And they could email me any question about anything at all. <laughs> and I would just answer it for the first five minutes of class. And it was, they, it's, there were some students that got angry at me and said, it's not on the exam. Uh, <laughs> but the rest, I mean, that was the, by far their favorite part because I think it was a way of sort of communicating to them that immediate utility was not the goal. And the reason why is because you have to learn how to be able to think on your feet about questions and learn how to learn, which somebody else already said. And to me, that's how we can sort of think about raising the profile is to say utility is not the goal, not because you don't want to be productive members of society or like be able to build a bridge or whatever it is that you want to do, but because you don't know what you want to do. And so immediate utility is useless. Now you know why we have such a great faculty, right? <laughs> Here's a great representation, right? And, and, and it's one of the reasons why I really love my job is because I get to talk with these people whenever I get to see them <laughs> on campus. Now, we're sort of at the end of the time here, and I only asked two of the questions that I had. <laughs> so I, I know that I'm not going to get through everything that I, that I want. I'm also going to relinquish my role as moderator and let the intensity loose. Um, and just... Uh, I don't know if we can take it. Yes, well, that's up to you. I'm feeling very immoderate. <laughs> <laughs> is, is rather than to ask a question, because I, I do know that, that these people have been up for a, long, a, a, a lot today and, and are tired and we're supposed to be closing down about now, is just to ask any of you or all of you to, to, to share any closing remark that you would like, just with the understanding that you know, it is getting late, so to not go on too long. But <laughs> I, I know that, that there are probably, you know, there's probably something that each of you, or if not, that's fine, would like to share uh, in a, as a closing remark for, um, you know, our Board of Visitors, who really are interested in knowing about what goes on here, what's important here, what you all think, uh, pretty much anything along those lines. And I, I know that each one of you probably could say something about that topic. So why don't we just start from that end and come this oh, way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, so I guess th the closing remark I would make is, is that um, I, I uh, got a liberal arts education at, at the University of Virginia. And for me, having the core uh, of the liberal arts was hugely influential to my career. And I do things involving sort of biophysics and cancer now. But uh, I think that for me, there's no way that I would be where I am, doing the things that I feel like I can do to make a real difference in the world, unless I had, in addition to all of the science classes which I had, uh, learned to communicate and communicate effectively. Um, and so for me, I think the mixture of that is magic. 
the, and, and so I think that when you're thinking about why liberal arts is sort of conducive to really people making magic, right? Not, I'm not saying I do that, but like when I see people who really do, I think it has to do with the fact that they have learned to sort of communicate the, the sort of broad knowledge that they've developed. I think one of the things maybe looking forwards, Syracuse is kind of um, unique in the sense that we have world-class faculty in all areas, all across the liberal arts, sciences, humanities, um, uh, social sciences, all these different areas. We have world-class faculty who are very engaged with our students. We're a university that's big enough to have deep, diverse research interests, but it's small enough that the students at the university know their faculty members, are actively engaged with the faculty doing this cutting edge research. It's not, you know, we were saying earlier, it's not like the physics department's a faculty of 120 people and the students don't know who we all are. Our undergraduate students walk into our offices and talk to us and do research with us. How can we take Syracuse to just, and particularly the College of Arts and Sciences in Syracuse where this exciting intellectual research is happening, just take us to you know, the next level where we can build on what we have and let's start that conversation of you know, building on you know, this really great foundation that we have, the great students we have, the great faculty we have, where can we go to take us to the next level and really be world class in, in all the different areas, in teaching and learning and research and all these different things? I think that's the conversation that we, we need to start having as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think what I would like folks to know about the students at Syracuse is that um, that I didn't know coming here um, was just how dedicated they really are um, I like I've said I've had students who come into my lab I torture them <laughs> uh, so I don't accept anyone higher up than a sophomore because it takes me a year to train them and I make them volunteer 10 hours a week in my lab for a semester before I'm willing to give them any credit for their participating in research the following semester. I've never had anyone leave before they've graduated. And they've devoted 10 hours a week every semester for approximately three years of their lives being in my lab. Um, and all they want to know is, can you explain to us why we're doing the experiments that we're doing? And I think that that embodies you know, the students that we see. Um, and I have students who are pre-med, I have students who are uh, CF, uh, communication, uh, sorry, child, child and family studies, I have students who are in architecture somehow, um, <laughs> in psychology and in biology, all across a bunch of disciplines. And that's always the question, is really trying to understand why we're doing what we're doing and how can we take it to the next step. And those students are there and they're devoting their time and they're giving up a lot of other fun to be in the lab and to be working really hard. Um, a lot, and so that's kind of what I want to say. Okay, this was part one of my <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't get to. I'm going to skip part four, which was a brilliant sports. Next <laughs> <laughs> year, just, just, just get to this, and it follows actually very nicely on what what Mary said. Um, I think that being a person who studies religion for a living, I think that more or less all the question, all the big questions end up in physics or religion. <laughs> no offense to anybody else, but that's, if, if there's a natural order of, uh, if there's a natural answer, there's, it's gonna be in some way physical, biological, chemical, and if it, there's not, it's gonna come to us. <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, and so I like to think that when my students leave, whether they are architects or biologists or God help them religionators, uh, that they leave my class not just with answers, but with better questions and better tools for asking them, because I think it's better next questions that change worlds. Mm. So your question was really, when do we want the, the Board of Visitors to think about or know? Yeah, <laughs> any, anything, anything that you want to share with them. Um, I guess and now I'm now the faculty rep to the Board of Trustees, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the future of the university these days. And I guess I think that one thing um, I've been thinking a lot about is how the Board of Trustees and the Board of Advisors and Board of Visitors interact and get to know the faculty. I think it's, it's very easy to sort of think the faculty you know, are doing what they do and aren't really integral to the future of the university, but I think you can tell from tonight that it's actually, we actually are the key. 
And I think exactly this type of event is what we need so that people understand and we can move forward together. Um, we spend an enormous amount of time with the students um, and in thinking about the curriculum and the future of the university. And I think that it's something that we're going to have to move forward uh, building together. And so I think it's just, a, it's been a really fun evening again to, to, to talk with some of you individually. You're, you're crucial to the future of the university. Um, we're under a lot of pressure for co sort of commodification of what we do. And you can see that the kind of things that we do require us to be in settings where we can reach students and uh, you know, share our passions with them. And that takes time. It doesn't happen if every class is 150. It doesn't happen if there aren't labs. It doesn't happen if there are undergraduate research projects. And so I think you can think about how you feel about that and how if you believe that that's important, how you can support that moving forward. So that's something that I would like to you to think about as, as you get some sleep tonight. <laughs> I guess I just wanted to say, I, I, I love the conversa brief conversation we had when you came in. Um, the, my first year here, uh, my second year here, I started a class that I conceived of my first year and rammed down the English department's throat. And it was a cl class called Living Writers and Their Dead Pals that was, <laughs> that, and you were in like the first or second year of that class and you were saying you saw just share a little bit. You saw Tobias Wolf came Oh, it was incredible. So he basically read five books over the semester, but after you finished the book, they would bring in the author and they would put them on stage. And right or wrong, 19 and 20 year olds could ask them anything on the side. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we heard questions like, why did the character go in this direction? They should have gone in this direction. <laughs> Thanks from the, uh, the yeah. audience. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic class. But, but I, the Living Writers class, which is to me a place where it's a, put it like a 300 student class at this point, and it are, it's headed by these amazing graduate students teach the lecture sections, and then we have visiting writers. The caliber of those writers um, varies enormously based entirely on financing. Mm -hmm. That uh, this year we had Cheryl Strayed uh, who was a former student of George's and, and a friend of mine and, and came really, we could not have afforded her. If not she even <laughs> not, even, not even close. If she hadn't had the experience she had here at Syracuse. And, and what she said. She uh, came for free, essentially. She came uh, for free and spoke to a packed house of maybe 700, 800. Wow. Is that right, but something like that. Uh, uh, under, mostly undergraduates, and she told a great story, I'm just going to tell it very quickly, about bringing her kids to, uh, her kids convincing her to jump off a mountain and paraglide in the south of France. <laughs> her children, I don't know how, I mean, I, I, she was telling the story, I was thinking, Cheryl, you're an idiot, but, I'm <laughs> but she, they talked her into doing this, and, that, and then she and her husband are saying she's watching them paraglide down, uh, you know, this get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, they leap off this hill and they're helplessly waiting for them, of course, to crash and die. But, uh, but eventually they land in the fluffy field and everybody's happy. And she said, and I was thinking before I came here tonight that that's what Syracuse gave to me, was that I came here and they funded me and they told me that I could be a writer, even though her mother had never gone to college and died and Cheryl was orphaned and had been a heroin addict and a sex addict and had all these horrible things happen to her. And they told, she came here and she said, you funded me, you believed in me, you brought me up to the top of the mountain and all I had to do was jump. And to me, that's that connection from Tobias Wolf, George who went here, Cheryl, the tradition is is like the basketball tradition. It's a, it's a <laughs> legacy. It's that more consistent. Being a history major, though, that was the only English class I took at Syracuse, and it's a standout. Mm -hmm. Right. Think about that. Yeah. Crossing over, and it's still ringing the bell. Right. Yeah. I would just say one thing. I came here uh, at about 26 years old, having graduated from the School of Mines in Colorado. So the view. That's not great. Mimes. That's like Mimes. And I uh, had never really I think I take maybe school. two English classes, but I got in on my writing came here, and the thing that I, when I think of our college at its best, 
I kind of think of what it did for me. I came in really uh, not confident at all. Uh, like an outsider, was afraid of being mocked, uh, wasn't at all confident that my talent had any, any resilience. The faculty and the atmosphere and the college and the students all together basically said something like this, whatever you are bringing to us, we accept it. It's workable through work. So in other words, I could come in with all my little flaws and these weird background and working class ticks. They said, all right, that's what you got. We can work with that. And then through the process of rigor, they showed you how to do that. How to, how to like Chekhov said, how to, how to squeeze the, the surf out of yourself, <laughs> you know? So, so in my mind, they, yeah, sir, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, peasant, peasant. So, so that, in, in the best case, that's what we do. We take somebody who has been buffeted by life, and that even if they're only they're only eighteen, and we say, whatever you got, we'll take it, and we'll help you transform it. And there are methods by which human beings have been doing that for thousands of years. Don't worry about it; you'll be good. And that's <laughs> you know, that's nice work. <laughs> well, I was actually a little bit disappointed that we haven't heard the perspective of uh, Professor Greenberg here. <laughs> Dean Greenberg. <laughs> um, uh, most of us uh, were transmitted uh, some things that he has written about it. And I think one of, the, one of the most instructive things I found in there was he actually broke down the etymology of the liberal arts. And that was actually a really good thing for me because I had an undergraduate experience that didn't have much in the way of the liberal arts. This was in Arkansas, and the word liberal was anathema. <laughs> <laughs> Very many people's ethos. <laughs> but uh, so, so it was really kind of interesting to, to hear in your words talking about uh, liberal as being uh, the root, 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 root of freedom, mm -hmm. you know, freeing. These are uh, skills, in a way, not necessarily like instantly translatable job skills, but like the skills of thinking about thinking, as you said. So these are the skills, these critical, analytical, thinking about thinking skills, these creative skills that free us. And I think that's really what we've been talking about here when we talk about getting used to not knowing the answer, exploring with confidence and increasing that confidence level. And I think when we think about what we wanna do uh, individually and collectively is continue that and continue to go beyond our level of confidence, continue to face these challenges and understand that there are some things that are beyond our comfort zone. There are some things that we could challenge ourselves to do. Uh, there are um, areas in which we are still doing things the way that we've always done them because we've always done them <laughs> that way. And uh, I think when people have innovative ideas and uh, ideas about uh, research or teaching uh, that aren't necessarily um, you know, what we think of as what we've always thought of, uh, <laughs> then maybe we need some support to, to head in these new directions. No, I, I think those are, are, are quite fitting words to end on. Um, would you join me in, in giving a round of applause for our faculty members? I, I really, I really do think, you know, I, I sort of chuckled when I saw this was going to be an intense liberal arts experience, <laughs> but I really think it was a liberal arts, uh, an intense liberal arts experience. And I also think I did a reasonably good job in moderating it because, 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 because you're all still here and alive. It's not like you burst into flames or anything. <laughs> So thank you all so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank and you so so thanks very and much for, for coming and enjoying. Yeah. 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 Yeah.